legislative harmonization assessment of Brazilian law. We are pleasant to present three professors who have a deep knowledge of this topic. Professor Aris Gergopoulos from University of Nottingham, Professor Paula Faustino also from University of Nottingham, and then finally, Professor Marçal Justin from IDP, renowned jurist and scientific coordinator of this event. Before starting the lecture, allow me to clarify the functioning of this meeting, which will last approximately one hour and 30 minutes. Each teacher will speak from approximately 20 minutes. During the lectures, viewers or web viewers will be able to uh, send this question via chat available on YouTube or maybe in questions and answers on the Zoom platform. After the ending of the lectures, I will try, with the help of the audience, to encourage the deepening of one or another aspect addressed in the lectures, especially uh, relevant according to the Brazilian reality. I am Maurizio Zocum, professor of the administrative law at the Pontifical New Catholic University of Sao Paulo, PUC, and I'm very honored to be the moderator of this morning panel. Okay, uh, let's start with the first speaker, uh, Professor, I believe, which one to start? Professor Paula, Professor Aris, let's start with Professor Aris. All right, All right Professor Aris Gergopoulos is Assistant Professor in European and Public Law at School of Law of the University of Nottingham, Head of Research Unit for Strategic and Defense Procurement of the Public Procurement Research Group uh, of the University of Nottingham. And finally, according with, uh, according with Professor Cesar, he's a fan of Brazil. <laughs> so, um, so, Professor Aris, do you have the, the word? Please enlighten us. Bom dia uh, e boa, uh, boa tarde da Grécia. Uh, é um grande honor, uh, honra igualmente um grande prazer participar uh, desta sessão. Uh, meu português não é ótimo, estou trabalhando nisso, uh, mas eu entendo o suficiente. Agora continuarei em inglês pelo resto da minha apresentação. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, uh, invitation. It's a great uh, honor indeed. Um, to um, participate uh, in this series. Uh, as I will explain in a moment, uh, I have a close connection both in terms of interest for the, for, for the uh, country as a whole, its culture, but also uh, for its uh, public procurement system, especially in the context of this, each uh, a process of acceding to the uh, government procurement uh, uh, agreement. Let me share with you my uh, presentation. Hopefully, let me put it here. Okay. Right. Okay, so can you see it? Excellent. Uh, so given the that today's session uh, looks at the process of harmonization uh, in the context of the GPA accession negotiations, uh, I would uh, like to, uh, as I will explain in a moment, let's look at the outline of the presentation. It's, I will have a very brief introduction about uh, uh, my connections with Brazil and my interest in the legal system, especially the public procurement legal system there. Uh, and then I would try to explore the notion of GPA harmonization that we have seen also in the title, but uh, and forms, if you want, the, the, the gist and the focus of today's uh, webinar. Uh, then what I will try to do very uh, uh, briefly, because I would like, they are open-ended um, uh, items, if you want, for further discussion, hopefully we'll have a fruitful discussion after this, is I will explore uh, uh, quickly what I consider, right, don't uh, use that <laughs> to your advantage in the negotiation, but literally what I consider uh, as the advantages of the existing Brazilian system of public procurement in the context 
of the challenge or the task of uh, uh, negotiating and adapting uh, its current uh, legal system to the GPA framework. And then I will uh, identify, again, this is, a, this is a wide brush. Uh, we could uh, um, discuss that in much more detail, but I uh, will identify what I consider some possible points of contention that may arise in the process of um, the negotiations and also the application of um, uh, the system, the GPA system in the, um, the Brazilian public procurement framework. And finally, I will very quickly uh, again um, share with you some preliminary thoughts about the forthcoming, the ongoing rather, uh, process of accession. We are, uh, um, uh, uh, Brazil um, um, uh, tabled its intention to start negotiation and at the moment, according to the latest documents uh, of, uh, from, uh, submitted by the Brazilian delegation, Brazil, uh, in the context of, of course, COVID, as much as this is allowed, is in the process of putting forward the technical, if you want, uh, part of its submission. Uh, and then later in the year, probably by fall, will be shared with the other signatories, well, with the secretariat of the GPA and the other parties of the GPA. So let me start. Um, about me, uh, uh, we, we, we heard a little bit, I'm from the University of Nottingham, uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, here with you. My connection with Brazil, uh, I have two hats. I'm wearing today two hats. The one is the academic hat, but also the other is the practitioner's hat, both as a lawyer uh, in Greece. I'm uh, registered with the Supreme Court uh, here. Uh, and also as a consultant on regulatory um, uh, reform in procurement and uh, public law more generally. So my connection to Brazil is very interesting because I have been a visiting fellow both to, uh, for the last few years, both to the Federal University of uh, Rio Grande do Sul and of the Espiritu Santo. And of course, uh, I have a very close connection. I would like to use this opportunity to thank Cesar for the invitation once again. Uh, uh, we have a, a close collaboration uh, with Cesar and Rafael, uh, both in the context of a book that I co-edited where Cesar and Rafael submitted, if you want, the Brazilian chapter, very interesting uh, uh, reads uh, about the internationalization of regulation of public procurement, uh, but also the fact that they visited us at Nottingham uh, more than once as part of the visiting program that we have in our uh, institutions. We like to uh, very much enjoy receiving colleagues from around the world that would like to spend a uh, few, uh, you know, some time with us and do some research on procurement. And if I'm not wrong, they also had the chance to participate in some of the uh, modules that we provide at Nottingham uh, in the executive program of public procurement, which is a distance program. If you would like to find out more about that, please send me or uh, Paola later. You, uh, we'll leave our contact details uh, an email. So, and the last but not least, I have, as we will explain in a moment, a very keen interest in the Brazilian uh, system uh, as a whole. Not least because the Brazilian system, both uh, the constitutional side and also the procurement side presents uh, some similarities with jurisdictions that I have been involved in actively. One is Greece and the other, of course, is the UK. So the similarities with the Greek system is the fact that uh, both systems have provisions of public procurement in their constitution. They are, we are not many, I don't think, uh, that have constitutional provisions that refer to public procurement. In the case of Brazil, of course, the provision is much more encompassing. In Greece, it refers to uh, some issues about conflict of interest that the Greek constitutional legislator decided as being important to, you know, uh, to, to give that higher legal uh, authority. But in the any exploration of the uh, procurement system in Brazil, of course, um, we start by the constitution. And it's very, very interesting that this you know, quite uh, 
specific the uh, priorities and aims that public procurement, uh, the public procurement system in Brazil has to meet. The other thing that I find very interesting, and it is linked with public procurement, is the uh, diffused um, um, form of constitutionality review uh, through the legal system, uh, as opposed to a purely central, centralized constitutional review. And given the fact that there is a constitutional provision right, uh, in the Brazilian legal system, uh, that may provide later on some interesting parameters to look at, uh, and I'm talking about the, the, our colleagues, uh, the practitioners in Brazil, when the, <coughs> excuse me, when Brazil joins, hopefully soon, the GPA, if that connection and that diffused, if you want constitutionality review, may give rise to some claims or such challenges. This is an open-ended question. I'm just uh, late laying it out there uh, as a possibility uh, to look uh, forward um, uh, to. Um, then let me proceed with some, um, ah, and the connection of course with the UK is that despite the fact that uh, the Brazilian legal system is closely linked with the, what we would call a civil law legal system, continental European legal system, it nevertheless does not have a separate jurisdiction in the judicial branch for uh, administrative law. Uh, similarity, so there is a unitary, uh, um, uh, the judicial branch is unitary, like in the uh, United Kingdom. In Greece, we follow much closer the French model, so we have a separate administrative jurisdiction. So, what do we mean by GPA harmonization? I would like to clarify how you understand the term. I think that the term harmonization implies too much, especially if we use it to try to explain and describe what the GPA does uh, or what is meant to do in its current form, okay? Uh, so I think it's a, to, to refer to the process established through the GPA framework as leading to harmonization, I think it's, a, it's too much. It's a maximalist uh, term. And because of that, it may lead to dis misunderstandings. Um, what I prefer is to um, refer, to look at the GPA um, as it currently is, which is a set of minimum standards, certain standards, but they form, if you want, the basis. And of course, member, state, member states, the signatories could, if they choose, provide higher standards. But the GPA identifies the minimum standards with the aim of opening up mutually uh, the opportunities to the very lucrative public procurement global market. Okay? Um, so, and what's more, that set of standards allows for a significant margin of discretion, of maneuverability uh, to the signatories when they decide, when they will implement these standards in their legal order. Okay, so there is a, a lot of flexibility. As long as you meet the standards, the way that you and the, the tools that you will use to meet those standards may vary quite considerably. Now, Currently, there is a debate, and we are participating in that, and some colleagues in later webinars uh, will perhaps have the chance to explore a little bit more uh, uh, the issue of regulatory approximation as an additional further aim of the GPA. That is definitely a discussion that could be, ha could be had in the future, and probably we will have it. But uh, at the moment, I think uh, that the description of the GPA as a regime that leads to harmonization of procurement systems, I think this uh, a little bit, um, uh, um, you know, maximalist. You know, it, it's it's not entirely what happens, uh, what what the system is. Now let me turn quickly to what I consider as the advantages of the Brazilian public procurement system in its current form. Identify few, there they will be, there are more, but I think these are the more, uh, generically speaking, more important themes that I have identified so far. 
First of all, if we look at the regulatory system, the rules, okay, the procedures uh, and the other frameworks that lead to the award of the contract and then uh, carry um, or, or uh, are linked with the uh, oversight of the execution of the contract, the regulatory system itself is well developed. It's quite detailed, it has a history. And uh, last but not least, because of the conclusion by, the, uh, by Brazil of a number of FTAs, free trade agreements, with detailed procurement chapters that correspond to the provisions of the GPA, one could argue that in terms of the formal um, implementation and meeting of those uh, of fun some fundamental standards in terms of the provisions themselves and how they fit within the system, Brazil is more than halfway there, in my view. I'm happy to discuss that, of course. But apart from the regulatory aspect, we see that the institutional environment also is quite advanced. And by institutional, I, I refer to the various uh, bodies that they are involved, especially in the context of enforcement of the rules. So we see a number of, uh, a combination of judicial and quasi-judicial avenues for aggrieved parties to try and get justice or challenge uh, the uh, procurement process. And in this context also achieve uh, or help the system achieve its objectives of probity, <clears throat> good governance, and so on and so forth. And not only that, it also uh, it includes a very advanced, in terms of the, of, of the, of the eligibility of, of a possible challenge, uh, possibility, which is what I consider, and I would like to invite uh, the colleagues, the Brazilian colleagues, to correct me if I understood this wrongly, but there is the possibility of any citizens, any citizen, including of course group of citizens, to challenge or bring representation before the uh, court of accounts, courts of accounts in Brazil, which then this representation may lead to binding uh, decisions that affect the result, right, or the uh, conduct of a procurement process. This is quite, quite advanced. And certainly, on the face of it, it meets the required standards of the government procurement agreement. Um, also, from a practical perspective, when it comes down to implementation, not harmonization, but implementation of the GPA in Brazil, uh, I think that despite the fact that Brazil is a federation, the public procurement regime itself is fairly centralized. And this is a big difference, for example, with uh, the situation in, in, in the United States, which because of that difference, that explains, or at least it has been used by American negotiators as a practical way of limiting at the beginning, uh, the, you know, the, the level of uh, openness in their negotiations in the GPA. So first federal and few state, but not all states at the beginning, at least. Here in Brazil, and that could work if you want <laughs> against you in a way, if you are thinking of limiting in the negotiations, the access to sub to federal, uh, sorry, sub federal state procurements. You could still try to do that, but that would be a purely a political choice as opposed to, you know, uh, not ne necessarily facilitated or helped by a legal argument, ne legal technical argument that says, look, we are a federation. We have now negotiating an international agreement. We can ensure what happens at federal level, but we don't have the competence and so on and so forth to ensure that uh, openness also takes place at sub-federal level. Now, legally speaking, from uh, and I think the fact that internally this centralization is allowed, I assume that also that has an external uh, aspect uh, when it comes down to negotiating trade agreements. The last point, the last theme, is the fact that recently Brazil has adopted a more flexible, flexible is the right word? Yes, a more uh, responsive, flexible, parallel regime, uh, which is the differentiated procurement uh, system, 
uh, that I think is in tune with the direction that both the GPA and other big regional agreements like the uh, European Union um, take to allow and cater for greater flexibility in the, in the process of procurement, allowing uh, increasingly more the possibility of negotiations within the procurement process with at least the winning bidder, right? Before uh, the, the, the conclusion of a contract. Um, as I understood it, up until then, the Brazilian system, because of, you know, again, links with the constitution, was more rigid uh, in terms of what the procurement authorities could do in the process of, um, of awarding or carrying out a procurement competition. Uh, and with this differentiated approach, which of course started in the context of the big events that uh, Brazil successfully held in the recent past, but now uh, has the possibility of expanding beyond those uh, sectors. So it was not that regulatory framework was, was not one off for you know, six years leading up to the, um, um, the big, or the, the, the big uh, athletic uh, and sport events, but of course could be further used later on. And I think, as I said, is in tune with the direction that uh, the application and practice of both the GPA, but also other big and influential uh, regional, uh, um, regional frameworks follow at the moment. So these are the positives, the advantages as I see them. Now let's look at some of the points of contention. They are not the only ones. Uh, I, I try to focus more on the on the actual, if you want, um, re regime, as opposed to issues about uh, the, the, the width of, of, of the openness and the sectors that would be included in the negotiation. So I start by the fact that, as you uh, know very well, linked again with a constitutional principle that allows certain exemptions from the rule of equal treatment, which is it has general application, there is legislation that allows, not only allows, actually it sets as one of, of, of the objectives, the, the, um, the aims of procurement legislation and application of this law, the attainment of sustainability, which is great, but not just sustainability as a whole, national sustainability. Now, uh, I underline the, if you, I gave the emphasis on the national, because in practice, at least this is the perception that the negotiators will have from outside is that uh, the emphasis was given more has has been given more to the national than, than the sustainable uh, and we could have this discussion but this definitely could be would be one of the issues that will uh, need to be addressed um, link with this there are various at the moment as we speak uh, various types of national preferences uh, that uh, price preferences that they are given to specific products uh, that favor, if you want, give uh, uh, a head start to uh, locally produce uh, products or pro products uh, produced and uh, services supplied by uh, Brazilian companies. And of course, Brazil has a very, also one area that I'm very much interested in, apart from social sustainability, is strategic and defense procurement. Now, I use in my um, discussions with colleagues in the defense and security sector as Brazil, Brazil and Israel, really, as the two, and, and Belgium, the aerospace sector, as the three successful examples of the use of offsets as a means to create, uh, to, 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 to support a nascent uh, industry and then help it to grow and become an international player. And definitely the Brazilian aerospace sector is now uh, a big player. So it has been huge. Of course, there are some negatives, but the result is that, that it has been used in a way to support and create uh, new players. Um, and break the duopoly that we see between you know, uh, Europe and, uh, and the United States in this field. From a practical perspective, um, and although even now, unless there are specific reasons, 
uh, in principle, uh, international bidders can participate unless there are, you know, there the, the are exceptions for their inclusion. But there are de facto hurdles that they have to face. Some of these hurdles are linked with the needs for prior authorization for them to be allowed to carry out contractual obligations in, uh, in Brazil. And also the fact that uh, Brazil, because it uses quite uh, a lot framework agreements that they are linked with certain you know, uh, pre-qualifications lists, that technical, how you get on the list uh, presents de facto at least some greater challenges for, non, uh, for companies that they are not based in Brazil. Okay, so that would be definitely an issue to look at. Uh, I refer to the authorization process for foreign suppliers. Now, uh, this is linked more with the issue, not so much the framework itself, but you know, the, the, the offer of how much uh, Brazil is willing to open up its public uh, procurement market. So the state-owned enterprise of which there are few and very important in Brazil, that would be a point of contention. And uh, this is linked with my last point, which is the connection with the, the Chinese accession negotiations. And of course, a, a very advanced system of uh, helping small and medium-sized enterprises. The good news for Brazil is that the GPA contains a number of uh, tools to facilitate, at least for a certain period of time, this assistance to small and medium-sized enterprises. And this, of course, is linked to the wider reorientation of practice in public procurement to cater uh, for the needs of small uh, and medium-sized enterprises that in most countries constitute the backbone of their economies. Okay, Of course, in the post-COVID era, that definitely would be uh, a point to look at. So that's why I have the question mark there. It's not necessarily a point of contention, uh, but certain adaptations will need to be made uh, in the process of negotiation before Brazil, I think, fully becomes a member uh, of the uh, a signatory of the government procurement agreement. And some final thought, and I will end with this, is that uh, I think because of timing, but not only, right, we have in Brazil and China, we have two letters of the BRICS, right? Big economies, uh, emerging economies, the new sort of players, the new kids of the block, and international trade, as I would like to call them. I think that the Brazilian uh, accession negotiations will have an impact, will affect and be affected from the parallel ongoing negotiations with China. The SOEs, right, is one of the areas where I see that uh, in interrelation um, will, will be seen uh, soon because it would be very weird for the negotiate the other parties the existing parties of the gpa to adopt a different approach with regards to the inclusion of the soes towards china and another approach toward brazil and vice versa so thank you very much for your attention here uh, i'm finishing with few things first of all i would like to thank you this is the book where um uh rafael and uh cesar participated and I would like to draw your attention to my email. If you have any questions about our distance course, please do send me uh, an email. And below that, you can see my um, uh, website and Twitter account. And uh, yes, please tune in because there are some interesting stuff going on there as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, Professor Aris, uh, thank you for your, your lecture and the very interesting point of view on the government procurement system between Brazil and Greece. In this addition, I think it's a great task you can find to expand then the flexibility that Brazil will be able to adopt when intend to join to the GPA. It's a quite a challenge. <laughs> it's a great challenge. And even more interesting, considering that the need for, according to the Brazilian constitution, that they have uh, national rules to observe for all the uh, all the states and, and counties 
uh, say quite different the system. So it's a, it's a great challenge that they will have now. Oh. So now I want to introduce uh, Professor Paula Bordalo Faustino. He's a doctor of uh, juridical sciences for University of Nottingham, member of the Public Procurement Research Group, also of University of Nottingham, and also is a, a, a brother from Portugal, oh, a sister from Portugal, in fact. <laughs> so, uh, Professor Paula, uh, it's a, quite a pleasure to, to, to stay with us, and uh, we are waiting for your lecture. Thank you again. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, depending on when you're um, watching us. It is indeed a pleasure for me and an honor to participate in this webinar series, um, co-hosted by the Instituto Brasileirense de Direito Público and the Public Procurement Research Group at the University of Nottingham. Uh, umas muito breves palavras em português para dizer que realmente é um, é um prazer para mim estar aqui não só em representação na Universidade de Nottingham, mas estar uh, com a minha irmandade mais alargada brasileira e, portanto, obrigado por me acolherem. Um, so on the topic of um, legislative harmonization, uh, I should um, just, in terms of four words, um, share with you that I have had in the past um, the privilege of having some um, legislative experience. So uh, in Portugal back in 2008, um, I worked for the Portuguese government to, uh, in order to draft the public procurement codes in, in Portugal. At the time we were implementing the 2004 directives. So I come from that uh, point of view as well in terms of um, approaching the, the topic for today's uh, webinar. So the experience as a proper legislator. So um, ARIS um, has just focused on uh, the, the substance, so to speak, of the uh, public procurement rules and let's uh, say mechanisms that may have either a positive or a negative impact uh, for Brazil when acceding to the GPA. I will focus on the process of legislative harmonization. Uh, and why I said I took a bit of a, 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 a legislator's perspective on this topic. So if I were the Brazilian legislator, what would I be thinking um, uh, um, uh, at this stage when you are uh, um, uh, proposing to exceed the GPA in terms of process rather than uh, content? I think uh, Aris gave you plenty of content for us to discuss later on. So I shall focus on the more sort of technical side to harmonization. So we'll quickly have a look at legislative harmonization as a regulatory technique. Uh, so apologies if I get a little bit technical here from an administrative law perspective. Uh, and then we'll uh, quickly go through the harmonization spectrum and Arvis anticipated uh, 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 a couple of ideas on this and I'm happy to uh, say that we agree on that. Um, and finally, I would like to just make a suggestion um, uh, where um, Brazil may wish to start in terms of looking at the process of doing this, the process of acceding to the GPA, um, harmonizing Brazilian uh, legislation um, at that supranational level, and uh, where to, to take it from there. So let's uh, start by looking at this regulatory technique that is often referred to as harmonization, uh, whether we agree more or less with this terminology, like Harris said, uh, is uh, debatable, but let's stick to the, uh, uh, the, the wording that was used for uh, the title of today's webinar. So the idea here is that um, we're talking about a technical process, regardless of the content. Obviously, in this case, we're talking about public procurement. Uh, but generically speaking, uh, legislative harmonization will always be about generating some set of common rules, which may be more or less developed. In this particular case, the idea is that these common rules are devoted to market building. So to facilitating uh, trade, 
and somehow making a contribution uh, for it to flow more freely um, uh, between the, the parties which uh, have acceded to the GPA, obviously. This idea of legislative harmonization um, has to do with what um, administrative lawyers uh, and constitutional lawyers and international lawyers usually refer to as interlegality. Uh, because in fact, it um, uh, is implemented via uh, a process of adoption. So uh, regional, national, local legal orders, in fact, adopt elements of a dominant legal order, in this case, uh, the GPA via the WTO, into their own uh, 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 lawmaking processes and practices. So this is the starting point, as in my understanding of legislative harmonization, regardless of whether this matches uh, um, harmonization uh, uh, required by the GPA or not, but we'll get there. We'll get there in a couple of minutes. I do agree with Aris that we would better uh, present this as an approximation of laws rather than a pure harmonization. Uh, but it is commonly, these two words are commonly used uh, interchangeably. Uh, so that's uh, my understanding for the purposes of this presentation. Now, what are the assumptions behind the legislative harmonization driven by the GPA? Well, on the one hand, that deferring national regimes, uh, uh, public procurement ones, obviously, uh, constitute regulatory barriers. So having different public procurement laws and regulations in different uh, um, uh, states uh, actually creates obstacles for suppliers wanting to uh, provide their uh, goods and services in, in different countries. So this sort of uh, uh, creates blockages to the flow of trade, which ultimately is, is the uh, objective of the, the GPA. So the other assumption is that logically, if we reduce or even ideally remove those barriers, those obstacles, those blockages, that would promote trade, at least in between uh, the, uh, the, the parties to the GPA. Okay, And I say ideally it would because uh, there is some evidence uh, um, at the EU level, so uh, in the European Union, that um, sometimes this actually uh, doesn't work as well as expected in practice. Uh, so that at EU uh, level, we do have some evidence that um, uh, uh, removing barriers to a, a considerably high standard uh, did not have a proportionate impact on uh, liberalization of trade. So there's obviously a lot to be said about this, and there's a lot of different factors involved, and we can't really directly compare the EU with the GPA. So the, the idea is still valid. Uh, different rules make it more burdensome, more difficult for suppliers to go around and, and uh, supply their goods and services in different countries. Having a common set of rules as a base um, facilitates trade. Um, whether there is a proportionate impact um, uh, 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 in, in the, from one assumption in, in the other, that's more uh, debatable. So you can actually have a very harmonized set of rules and you, you'd expect a, a, a more uh, beneficial effect on uh, trade than the, the one you actually get in practice. But it, it's still, uh, uh, the, the, the assumptions are still valid and the effort is still worth uh, going through. So this is ultimately the objective uh, with this legislative harmonization at GPA level, is opening up trade. Uh, so there is the, the, the GPA and uh, those of us studying it, researching it and uh, uh, writing about it, um, do establish a, a connection between a degree of harmonization and the promotion of market building. So this is our starting point, and this is what I build upon 
uh, in the rest of the presentation. So let's talk a little bit, again, from a legal technical perspective, how um, we can go about harmonizing uh, some, some field of law, some particular topic, uh, from maximum to a minimum type of approach. So you could have, and um, uh, there are examples, not at the WTO level, um, where harmonization tends to be uh, as maximalist as possible. In which case, we obviously understand that the consequence is states will be prevented from exercising their national competence uh, as soon as it's uh, uh, harmonized at a supranational level. And as I said, this can be uh, focused on a specific legal topic, or it can actually cover a whole uh, field. This is usually based on a perceived uh, need for a, a degree of uniformity. Um, but uh, most people would argue today and would agree that uh, this is going uh, further than desirable because it actually suppresses national diversity as if all states were the same, which we know by experience and even common sense that is not the case. Um, and uh, we also know that uh, rules tend to be less effective if they do not take into account the diversity uh, uh, between uh, states. So um, this is currently not a very trendy uh, type of harmonization. But that's one extreme. On the other, uh, quite opposite extreme, um, there is the minimum harmonization technique. Now, th the idea here is the opposite. We go for a bare minimum that we decide should be common, say, to all GPA parties. And then we allow plenty of discretion for national legislators to actually adapt that, develop it, and, and actually be creative as long as, obviously, there is a limit, as long as their actions, their measures, their rules, their laws, their mechanisms are consistent with the objectives of the dominant legal order, in our case, the GPA. Okay, So this is usually referred to by a very uh, well-known expression of level playing field. So with this minimum standard that we uh, aim our comments to all uh, um, states, we create a level playing field. So everybody is playing the same game, in this case, the public procurement trade game, if we were to call it that way. Um, in a level playing field, we all know the same rules, use the same rules, but that's just a, a minimum common uh, uh, between all the states. Because mostly there is deference to national diversity. So this technique, minimum harmonization, actually acknowledges that it is most important to allow space uh, for uh, states to actually come up with different rules based on what is specific to them, their culture, their legal system, uh, idiosyncrasies that may have to do with history, for instance, uh, uh, the protection of certain uh, national interests, etc. So here you have sort of the two extreme sides, sides of the harmonization spectrum. On the one hand, your left-hand side, if I'm correct, um, you have legal harmonization as in the sense of uh, maximum harmonization. And then on your right-hand side, you have uh, minimum harmonization as uh, the promotion of regulatory diversity. Now, what I'm interested in, and most people are, is the in-between, okay? So they're varying degrees of harmonization in between these two um, extremes. And whether you uh, uh, move yourself more towards the left or more towards the right, uh, you will, uh, um, uh, it will result in a different impact on the margin for 
national legislative options. So Brazil will have to sort of find its way in this spectrum and um, uh, in order to realize um, how much room the Brazilian legislature has in order to come up with uh, their own uh, um, uh, public procurement uh, uh, special rules, regulations, mechanisms, procedures, whilst complying with the GPA at the same time. And sometimes what the legislator tends to do is sort of skip this pace, this step. So they go straight into discussing rule by rule, procedure by procedure. And from uh, my own experience as a, a legislator, uh, this is very important homework that uh, I would recommend doing before getting into the detail, you know, and negotiate rule by rule, chapter by chapter, procedure by procedure. So trying to find where you fit within this spectrum and um, what you uh, are willing to concede in terms of regulatory diversity uh, in order to move more towards legal harmonization or the other way around. So this is sort of the theoretical framework, if you will, um, that um, I would recommend bearing in mind uh, before moving on to the more detailed discussion about rules and procedures, etc. And this obviously, in theory, applies to any sort of um, harmonization procedure. Uh, we will, we are now focusing on, on the public procurement one. So what I'd like to propose here, and this is obviously a very uh, humble suggestion, is that we go for an alternative approach, uh, which I didn't uh, invent myself. So I'm borrowing this from Deacon, if you're interested in, in doing some sort of further reading, it's available online. So he came up with this idea of reflexive harmonization, uh, which I quite like, um, and I think is a valuable way forward when you are, uh, um, embarking on the journey that Brazil um, is at the moment and um, to a certain degree having to uh, uh, harmonize its national uh, regulations in light of a supranational uh, set of rules. So the idea is that states learn from each other when they're developing their own laws. So this sort of um, draws your attention to the fact that there's not only a vertical relationship uh, or there's not only necessarily a vertical relationship when we talk about harmonization, i.e. the GPA and national law, we can actually uh, look at this broader picture sideways. In this case, it makes sense to look at other parties which are also part of the GPA. Um, the objective of this approach is to find the right balance for each state, so the balance can vary from state to state, but find the right balance, in this case for Brazil, between the need to harmonize on the one hand, but also the need to protect some of the Brazilian diversity that makes sense within uh, the national uh, rules and regulations. So despite having to adhere to these uh, standards um, imposed by the GPA, there's also a case for arguing that you should uh, be as concerned about harmonization as you should be about protecting the national rulemaking discretion that the GPA allows you to. And this is because obviously there will be traditions um, uh, that you may want to uh, stick to. Um, Brazilian legal culture will be different from other parties to the GPA, and that obviously uh, um, plays a major role, not only in implementing uh, the GPA, but uh, also enforcing it and making sure uh, um, it is uh, applied in a correct way. So it's also a, a compliance factor in this sense. And as I said previously, there may be relevant public interests why you'd want to have uh, specific rules for specific 
uh, things that you need not harmonize, okay? So I'm not advocating for non-compliance, not at all. I'm just saying there is room for both considering the need to comply and how you comply. And there's also room for deciding what you want to uh, still keep within your margin of discretion, uh, both from a legislative and an administrative perspective. So the focus and, and, and the, the, the specificity of this reflexive harmonization is that Deacon um, suggests this uh, uh, technique should be based on the observation and the emulation of other jurisdictions, i.e. we should look sideways, not just upwards towards the GPA, we should look sideways See, what are other parties to the GPA doing? Can I learn from them? Uh, is, is there something that I can uh, bring back to my own legal system and make it work uh, in the light of the GPA, but still benefiting, improving, and, and making my own public procurement system better? Again, uh, I am not uh, advocating a legal import of uh, solutions from other parties, okay? Uh, there, uh, I could give a, a separate le lecture on the transferability issues in terms of when some legal systems borrow solutions from other legal systems. That's not what reflective harmonization is about. It's about learning from others so you can critically look at your own legal systems and say, right, do I, am I compliant with the GPA? Could I possibly be more compliant if I learned something with other parties to the GPA and, uh, um, and, and make my own rules and procedures uh, better, at least better in terms of fitting with the GPA minimum standards. So uh, it's not about copy pasting legal solutions. And this has been very uh, common in the past. Very few people will uh, uh, support this in, in the present. So it's just critically looking at other um, uh, 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 legal systems and, um, and, and, and discussing whether uh, there's something you can learn from them and bring back to your own legal system and obviously adapt to your own legal culture, et cetera. So from that perspective, and also because you've all got by now, I'm Portuguese, I would like to suggest that Portugal could be uh, used as one of the uh, uh, potential uh, uh, systems that Brazil could look at to hopefully uh, learn something, even if, if it's something that you do not want to do, okay? So we also learn from others' mistakes, not only for their success. So you might look at Portugal or any other legal system and say, right, they did that, let's make sure we don't do the same, okay? Now, advantages of uh, doing this sort of exercise with Portugal, and I would uh, um, uh, suggest you do this with uh, several uh, uh, different procurement systems, not just the one. Uh, well, I, I think the most obvious uh, uh, advantage is the fact that we share a, a common language that greatly uh, uh, facilitates access to the sources of law, and, and a degree of understanding that you may not have with a, a foreign language. Also, like Aris mentioned earlier, we do share uh, a civil law tradition, which means uh, most of the sources of law and institutions have parallels in both jurisdictions. So that also helps you to understand why there might be some legal solutions and whether they work uh, in Brazil um, as well or not. There are also uh, similarities in terms of legal culture um, and I thought uh, about corruption and, and uh, the, the prevention of corruption as an issue that is definitely common to uh, these two countries and uh, so it, it might be interesting to look into how both uh, legal systems respond and whether uh, we can learn from each other and obviously because Portugal uh, is an EU member state and, and the EU is a party to the GPA, um, you would have uh, the assurance 
that uh, the, the Portuguese solutions uh, uh, are GPA compliant via the directives, obviously. So that might facilitate this sort of um, learning experience. There are obviously some uh, difficulties as well, which um, uh, have to do mainly with the fact that um, obviously our states are organized in a different way, Brazil being a federal state and Portugal uh, not. Um, and also, I believe, I mean, from a practical experience as a, a procurement lawyer, that the different size of the countries has a, a massive impact, obviously, on, on the size of the procurement itself, which may require some um, uh, 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 specific ways of addressing uh, that size of procurement, which uh, may be specific to Brazil, and you may not find a parallel uh, in Portugal. Um, so as I said, this is a humble suggestion, and I would uh, always uh, uh, recommend looking at other uh, uh, the potential uh, learning objects as well, not just the, public, the Portuguese public procurement system. One last word to say uh, uh, that I, uh, the, the sort of the idea I'd like to convey is that um, an effort needs to be made in order to balance these two um, um, values, harmonization on the one hand, but also protection of national diversity on the, the other hand, that you don't necessarily need to do it top down or bottom up. So looking from the Brazilian uh, um, regulations perspective up to the GPA, say, do I comply, do I not comply? As if you were doing a checklist, you don't need to just necessarily do it bottom uh, uh, bottom up or top down in that sort of vertical relationship, you can also do it sideways. So by this means of uh, uh, learning lessons with with other parties. Uh, if uh, Brazil uh, decides to take this opportunity to actually carry out a legislative reform and not just to tweak the law here and there in order to meet uh, the um, standards of the GPA, then this could be a brilliant uh, chance to, in one hand, simplify the system because it is a very developed and in, to a certain extent complex system. But uh, uh, by simplification, I don't mean uh, making it simple as in simplistic, uh, because I do think public procurement systems require a degree of sophistication, and namely when you have very focused values that you are wanting to uh, um, achieve, uh, and not only value for money, which is usually common to most procurement uh, uh, systems, but I would assume integrity in the case of Brazil, in a similar way in Portugal, is something that uh, we value and we invest a lot in terms of public procurement to try to achieve. Um, and this would be my contribution for today, uh, focusing and presenting you my perspective on the process of uh, legislative harmonization as if I were a legislator rather than uh, the substance of it, which um, uh, Eris um, very competently covered in the, in the previous uh, presentation. Um, that's it for me today. And um, uh, you can have my contacts and also uh, following on from what Ari said, if you're interested in our executive program in public procurement law and policy at the University of Nottingham, um, you can by all means email me or Aris, but there is a specific email if you want to get some more information about it. So thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Paula. It's a very enlightening lecture that you uh, show us and uh, allow me to be very sincere because I missed the most part of your conference because my internet is stopped for a few moments. So sorry, <laughs> sorry. <It's okay. laughs> I just call a, a Cesar, Cesar help me, but now it's so everything's okay. So yes, in any did. case, <laughs> thank you. Well, in any case, it was very interesting to know about the previous experience, especially in Portugal, uh, according to adopt the GPA and also about the why the possibility of adapting and harmonization or harmonizing GPA to the national standards. 
So I think we have a big challenge here in Brazil, trying to identify the part of uh, we are able to harmonize or not harmonize according with Brazilian constitutional system. And that's the reason, because uh, uh, thankful we have now Professor Marçal Justin. It's a great uh, uh, publicist here in Brazil. And uh, he is uh, one of the, I think, it's, uh, most uh, uh, competent professor is uh, able to uh, speak about that. Because he's a constitutional administrative professor and a man, they have many skills. So Professor Marçal is a former professor of uh, Faculdade uh, Universidade Federal do Paraná. Uh, is an author of several uh, books in the uh, procurement system and constitutional system and statistical system. So uh, Professor Marçal, once again, thank you for inviting me to, to this meeting. I also thank you, Cesar, to invite me and IDP. And uh, Professor, we are, we're, helping for your advices on this task, how to harmonize the resilient system with the GPA. <laughs> so, enlighten us. Um, hello. Hello. Uh, is my presentation on? Yes, we are seeing it. But uh, uh, just, uh, I believe you have to open we we'll see a part. Oh, that's fine. That's good now. Well, uh, well um, good morning to our audience in Brazil. Good afternoon to those in the UK and Europe. I would like to uh, thank IDP and the University of Nottingham sponsors of this webinar, and also Professor Sue Aerosmith from the University of Nottingham and uh, Cesar Pereira, who have been working very hard to allow us to be here and to um, implement this uh, webinar. And also I would like to say that it's uh, an honor to be here and to um, share this panel with uh, professors Aris Gergopoulos and uh, Paula Faustino, both from the University of uh, Nottingham, under the command of Professor uh, Mauricio Zocum uh, from the PUC São Paulo and president of the Brazilian Administrative Law Institute. It uh, I was listening and uh, I was realizing how far I was from the subject when I started uh, thinking about it. And it was so, I must start saying that it's a privilege to uh, listen to both Aries and Paula and uh, start to understand how things must be done in Brazil. And I will, uh, without further ado, uh, make a reference, a reference directly to this statement that Brazilian government, uh, this Minister of Economy, uh, well, they made in the beginning of the year, just before the start of this procedure of accessing the GPA. I quote, the accession of Brazil to OMC's GPA will not demand changes in legislation at first. This is a mislead uh, statement and uh, there is kind of sort of a mistake made by the Brazilian government. And uh, in a sense, I think that uh, there is this political uh, dimension of the problem. We must, as a country, take a decision to change our uh, position in the world and maybe take some, uh, uh, any kind of uh, openness in our economy. But if we decide to do that, 
we uh, must take the steps to uh, harmonize our legislation with GPA. And uh, in a sense, this um, statement shows either lack of knowledge of GPA or lack of knowledge of the Brazilian bidding laws or both. And uh, this is much more important because Brazil is at the imminence of the approval of a new law on public procurement. There is this project of law, 1292, and uh, it started its existence in 1995. And we are, have been discussing this uh, change since then, and it's at the Senate, Brazilian Senate, to final approval. And it does not have, does not take into consideration the GPA harmonization. And so this would be a kind of a huge mistake, I think, to approve a new law in the middle of this uh, accessing uh, uh, procedure. And we probably will have to change the new law immediately to uh, make the harmonization. In a other, on the other hand, uh, I think that we need a, a kind of a formal commission to be created to start studying formally the things that uh, we uh, must comply with, the points where Brazilian law uh, must uh, change and other things. Well, uh, uh, I, I'm taking for, uh, for granted the knowledge of GPA principles and rules. And I'm going directly to uh, general evaluation of the Brazilian bidding legal system. Everybody knows here in Brazil that law, and maybe even uh, uh, abroad, that law 8666 from 1993 is the most important law on bidding issues, but there are several others. And uh, some of them are specific on concessions, on telecoms, on energy. And so uh, depending on the choices of the Brazilian government, all these laws will have to be subjected to a review. And this is a very hard work to be done. Of course, uh, I cannot um, provide a deep uh, exam of the, all the relevant laws provisions. And I will just uh, try to focus, focus on law 8666. And because this is the general law and uh, making uh, an, uh, the approach with, uh, on law 8666 will allow us to have a general point of view uh, on relation uh, to uh, Brazilian uh, situation. There is a clear need of legal changes in our law 8666. There are other changes that uh, are not so clear, but uh, they appear like, uh, uh, like indirect barriers to uh, uh, foreign companies. And of course, we'll have the overcoming, we'll have to overcome the cultural difficulties. Uh, I was listening to Professor Paula and she was saying, well, uh, the cultural, difficult, cultural uh, characteristics must be respected. Uh, well, yes, I'm not uh, talking the same, about the same issue, just the cultural difficulties on public procurement, not uh, in a most broad uh, approach, but just the way that things are uh, developed here in Brazil, especially uh, at the public procurement level. Well, uh, it's true that Brazilian uh, 8666 law has this general non-discrimination principle. It's a formal clause. Uh, it's in, at the beginning of the law 8666. 
and it forbids the uh, differential treatment between Brazilian and foreign companies. This is clear, but uh, and uh, also there is this, even this provision for uh, foreign companies to comply with Brazilian uh, ex requisites for documents and other formalities, saying that uh, each uh, country, the law of each country will be followed in, at this, uh, for these uh, goals. And uh, more recently, there is this uh, normative instruction, I think that this is the translation, of Minister of Economy, uh, with admission for foreign companies to access the unified system for supplier enrollment. And this is uh, something very important because in Brazil at the federal level, every uh, 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 supplier must have this uh, enrollment. And uh, before this uh, instruction, it was very difficult for a foreign company to have access to this. And this was uh, an indirect barrier for a foreign company to uh, be awarded a contract here in Brazil. There is this traditional distinction in Brazil between international biddings and domestic biddings. This is a controversial uh, distinction. And there is a discussion about the meaning of this distinction, but I think that this would require a, a change and to um, provide a more clear uh, treatment for legal treatment for foreign companies. And uh, there are some cases of explicit conflict between uh, law 8666 and uh, foreign companies uh, and the GPA. Uh, one, the most evident is the breaking a tie rule, uh, article third, uh, paragraph second, uh, creates a preference uh, in favor of uh, for uh, Brazilian companies and Brazilian products in case of a tie. Of course, this is not compatible with the non-discrimination principle. But ooh, the main problem, I think that this is the um, central uh, thing to be uh, studied in Brazil the theme to be studied is the indirect barriers, especially related to the qualification to uh, dispute uh, public contracts in Brazil. Um, Brazilian law 8666 has a huge impact uh, in all sectors of uh, public procurement uh, uh, related to these uh, questions. The requirements for the qualification for all public procurement in Brazil are based in the uh, are based uh, in law 8666. The concessions law has no uh, the concessions laws have not provisions about this. So law 8666 is the central point of the uh, regulatory problems related to uh, discrimination against foreigners. Well, um, the first aspect is the fiscal and labor good standing, Article 29. Uh, we know that uh, GPA at Article 8, Item 4 um, allows the national uh, country to uh, adopt some uh, requisites on this area, taxes, payment of taxes, etc. Et but I think that Brazil uh, would take advantage of this uh, ac uh, accession uh, attempt to get rid of these uh, exigencies. Uh, almost all of them are not um, relevant for public procurement 
they're just a way to try to achieve other goals, like having people paying taxes, having people uh, paying their employees and other things. And this will reduce competition. And this will be, in some cases, a problem, not only for Brazilian uh, uh, bidders, but even for foreigner bidding, bidders. Uh, but the central of the central uh, barriers is the technical qualification. Uh, Brazilian law 8666 requires a bidder to register or to make an enrollment at the competent professional entity. In a sense, this uh, is not uh, a problem because uh, we know that the exercise, the uh, practice of a profession in a country must comply with the regulatory exigences. But in Brazil, there is the requisite of the bidder company to make uh, its registration at the comp competent professional entity. And this is very, very rigid for the engineering work and services. Uh, a foreign company, if uh, it is not registered at the competent professional entity, would not be able to uh, participate at a bidding in Brazil. And so, uh, as a, a, an additional um, question, uh, even the proof, the proof of previous experience in Brazil is uh, related to the registration of the certificates at the competent professional entity. So the company will be able to prove uh, the, its uh, experience just through the certificates if they are registered at the competent professional entities. And this is, of course, uh, it's not possible. Uh, uh, in some cases, when this, we have these international uh, uh, biddings, uh, the uh, administration, public administration, will express, make exclusion of this uh, rule, saying that uh, uh, the foreign company does not need to do this, but it's an exception. And uh, we have requirements of economical and financial qualification. And I think that this is uh, an opportunity for Brazil to overthrow the obsolete rules uh, that we have today. Because the uh, rules will uh, attribute, will give the public uh, uh, administration the hard work to discover if the uh, bidder uh, um, fulfills or not the economical financial qualification. It's much more advisable to adopt the suitable rules currently in, in use in other countries in the world, especially the certification by speci specialized institutions uh, that will say, well, this is a uh, reliable uh, bidder or it's not a reliable bidder. I, am, uh, I will uh, give you a certificate about this and the public uh, administration will not need to try to discover this by uh, itself. And we have another great uh, issue uh, related to the secondary policy objectives. Uh, Professor Iris to, uh, spoke about this. And the, like many other countries, we have public policies and sector incentives that are followed by uh, the idea that public uh, procurement would be a good way to do this, to use the power of the state to, for regulatory uh, goals. We have uh, some of the problems that Professor Aries uh, spoke about, uh, they disappeared because uh, all these, those decrees uh, you talked about, Professor, they had a, 
timetable uh, expiration date and they had not been renewed. So those uh, uh, decrees uh, are not uh, uh, applicable anymore. They are not more vigent, uh, vigent anymore. And, but we have this idea that uh, sustainable development is national development, not so much sustainable. That's true. And uh, the idea, the uh, initial idea of the rule, it was uh, introduced in the law 8666, was just national development. It would be a kind of a use uh, of the public uh, um, power to create uh, um, national champions and other things like this. And uh, at the end, the Congress introduced the sustainable. And it was not uh, precisely the idea, but uh, the sustainable, of course, is very, is politically correct. And it was uh, very welcome uh, at the uh, opportunity. We have micro and small businesses laws, and we have uh, industrial policy too. Uh, like Zona Franca de Manaus, is, uh, uh, we have a lot of rules uh, that benefit uh, industries uh, that are installed install there. And uh, even in the Brazilian competition, there, uh, we have differences uh, between uh, the domestic uh, uh, tenders. And we have directly award, awarded contracts. Contracts awarded without bidding. For instance, uh, Article 24, uh, item 13, that uh, reserves some uh, contracts only for Brazilian institutions. And these, of course, uh, are, uh, they must be uh, object or uh, subject to uh, uh, a review. We know that GPA uh, provides some alternatives for the maintenance or at least for uh, some time. Uh, maybe Brazil would use the, the exceptions of the appendix uh, one of the GPA in some cases. Uh, like uh, everybody says, the U.S. say uh, they have uh, preserved the small business uh, contracts, and maybe we can try to do something like this here. Uh, we have the uh, we. This is something that national proud uh, will be uh, challenged because the reservations for developing countries will. Um, uh, we will have to say we are a developing country. We're not a developed country. And so we will ask for these reservations. But of course, uh, Brazil's proud will be damaged. Uh, I don't know uh, what to say about that. But uh, of course, uh, Brazil is a de developing country. To deny that is to try to ignore reality. So. Uh, and we have even the, some uh, uh, situations where negotiation uh, that uh, Article 12 of GPA provides would be uh, in use. Well, there are some procedural alterations that we can think about. For, uh, for, uh, I think that uh, planned procurement uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, idea that is uh, at Article 7, Paragraph 4 of GPA, this would be a great improvement for Brazilian uh, practice. It would uh, conduct us um, uh, to uh, improve our day-to-day -day, uh, activities at the public administration. For sure, the deadlines uh, of Article 11 of GPA these must be uh, the Brazilian uh, deadlines uh, have to be changed. 
And I think that we could take advantage of this uh, idea of limited tendering. We have these uh, uh, two situations here in Brazil. Uh, Tomada de Preces and Convite, uh, we have these alternatives, but they are very, very uh, irrelevant in, the, uh, in Brazilian practice. And we uh, must, I think, uh, look at the experience in Europe and other countries where limited tendering is a very useful uh, solution. And uh, I think that we uh, should uh, adopt this uh, practice. And of course, negotiation, uh, uh, Brazil, some laws in Brazil uh, allows for negotiation, but others not. And even the laws that uh, uh, allow for negotiation, they uh, do not uh, have the same openness that GPA uh, provides. And so I think that we have to uh, consider this as a very good improvement for the efficiency and transparency uh, in Brazil and going for the transparency and procedural correction. In a sense, Brazil constitution and even the infra-constitutional laws, they assure the transparency and procedural correction, a fair uh, procedure, but we have the practical problem. In some cases, we have this uh, problem of summoning a public interest uh, without any explanation and uh, there is this tendency, uh, this is summing up by the uh, public administration. And there is this tendency by the control entities to favor the acts by the public administration without further uh, um, preoccupation. It, what I'm saying is that we are not favoring national bidders uh, in the sense, but we are uh, facing a problem that uh, even domestic national uh, companies have to uh, manage. But of course, this in a sense is an indirect problem because national uh, companies, they know how to manage this. And a foreign company would be surprised by this, especially uh, uh, because in Brazil, we have this presumption of legitimacy of the administrative act in uh, uh, its uh, adopted as a very huge argument. And uh, if we want a fair procedure, we will have to share the burden of the proof with administration. I mean, the uh, public administration will have to uh, uh, accept its burden to prove that uh, it is correct. Uh, uh, going to for the conclusions, uh, we have this uh, main question. We are discussing this here: the lack of concern by GPA with the carrying out of the contract. Because in Brazil, we don't have only bidding problems. We having uh, the contract regulation that is very different from. Uh, most countries in the world. Uh, uh, one of the problems in Brazil uh, uh, is related to the prerogatives of public administration that allows the administrative body to impose, uh, to impose some modifications, limitations, some things that uh, uh, are not uh, understandable by a foreign uh, uh, company. And this is not um, uh, compatible with the idea of a fair procedure, but it's not related to the bidding procedure. It goes after that. And, uh, uh, but I think that the relevance to the accession uh, to the GPA is uh, uh, undeniable. We must upgrade the uh, public administration standards in Brazil to the international level, to international level. And last but not least, the relevance uh, of the session to the GPA would be related to broad, broadening the competition. In this, 
would allow Brazil to increase the efficiency of the administration into, and to reduce corruption. It is a main, a very important issue in Brazil. And with this, I uh, finished. And I'm, I look forward to further discussions on this team. It was such a pleasure to uh, share these moments with you. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Marçal. Uh, without fear of making mistakes, I can safely saw or say that Professor Marçal is the biggest Brazilian academic reference in relation to the public procurement. That's a, that's a fact. <laughs> so, and uh, uh, his last one was uh, uh, rapidly mentioned by our Court of Justice. So thank you very much, Professor Marçal. So oh, I know we are past the schedule time, but as a moderator, I have a small power, just a little bit small, and which I intend to use fully. So uh, if you allow me, I have two questions. One for Professor Paula and Professor Aris, and another one to Professor Marcel. So uh, Professor Paula and Aris, thank you very much again, or once again for your uh, lectures. But as a professor of administrative law and a very active lawyer in lawsuits related to the government procurements, I would like to ask you both a question. And this question has a practical purpose. Uh, this is the question. According to your studies, what is the untouchable part of GPA? In other words, which aspects of a GPA should necessarily be incorporated by, by Brazilian law? This is a central my concern. And for Professor Marçal, I have one question. And once again, Professor Marçal, thank you again. Your, your explanations are all very clear and uh, didactical and uh, enlightened. So uh, in your view, uh, Professor Marçal, will GPA will not be received as a Swiss chess by the Brazilian system, so with uh, all holes? And uh, in this sense, do we not run the risk of complete the, discharacterizing the GPA, or in the other hand, or contrary, we will tropicalize the GPA? So I have a, a two points of view. So the untouchable part of GPA, according to the point of view of Professor Paula and Professor Iris. In the other hand, how, in the point of view of Professor Marcel, we're able to receive GPA according to Brazilian constitutional system. So Professor Paula and Professor Aris Gergopoulos, what's your opinion about that? Aris, do you want to go first? Shall I go first? I Whatever you prefer, Paul. Ladies first, always, please. Thank you. <laughs> well, what, what you refer to as untouchable part is um, matches what uh, me and Aris uh, refer to as the minimum harmonization standards. Um, Professor Suhar Smith covered this in, in a previous um, uh, webinar. Um, the short answer would be, in my opinion, uh, Aris is uh, welcome to uh, disagree. Uh, would be the two main principles, non-discrimination and transparency. But this short answer, uh, or behind this short answer, is actually a much bigger answer, because the way you achieve non-discrimination and transparency um, actually uh, um, implies that you implement at national level um, at least two dozens or so um, uh, obligations that derive from them, like uh, publishing notices, which obviously uh, is already provided in, in the Brazilian law. Uh, but issues like uh, barriers to participation, so uh, Professor Masal um, mentioned uh, at the qualification level, uh, so that will be part of the untouchable um, area of the GPA. Um, but uh, there, there are too many to mention. I just, excuse my dog. I just um, gave you the examples of the notices and, and the qualification, but there are, there are many more. Would you like to add to that, Aris? 
Um, I, I agree and completely with uh, um, Paola, what, what she says that fundamentally then what I call non, the non-negotiable, but the, the bare minimum, because they are around that, uh, trans, the transparency principle, the, i.e. the rules, the existence of rules and mechanisms to ensure that uh, a company that would like to participate or has the capacity to participate from around the world finds out about the opportunity, uh, has enough time to prepare in a meaningful way uh, their bids and participate uh, in a meaningful, again, way in the process. And the other part, which is really important, is the existence <clears throat> of an effective uh, system of challenges to enable, to give teeth to this process. Uh, going back to my presentation earlier on, I think they are in Brazil, the Brazilian institutional framework provides for these uh, and of course, it could be further streamlined and rational. Uh, you, you can streamline it, rationalize it uh, a, a, a little bit more. But fundamentally, um, they are in comparison with other countries that they are in the process. They have observer status, for example. I think Brazil, as I said, has a head start. The important thing is to ensure that international companies that they come from abroad, they have equal chances, de jure and de facto, of participating and challenging these uh, procedure, uh, procedures. Look, looking at uh, Mauricio's question in the reverse, uh, not that long ago, I mean, recently, a few months ago, Professor R. Smith has written a very interesting um, report. report. It, it's, it's, it's more um, a, a work about Contem uh, contemplation, if you want, about the possibilities in the UK revisiting of public procurement uh, regulation post-Brexit. And I agree with her that the bare minimum, because the, the UK is automatically, it is even outside the EU, remains, that's the status quo, remains a signatory of the GPA. Unless the UK decides to leave the GPA, these bare minima have to be, they, they have to be observed. And this is linked to what I said earlier before, that uh, from that point upwards, there are opportunities to configure the national regimes in all sorts of, way, of ways that meet these minimum standards, which is they are linked with transparency, uh, with other permutations of uh, uh, equal treatment, and of course, the effective and efficient enforcement mechanisms. Um, and th there is, I see, I don't know, uh, will we discuss the questions that they are in the chat room? Uh, Cesar, I think, has posted some. Um, to an extent, they are linked with what, with what we are discussing. Very quickly to say about the, the technical, the indirect, uh, um, uh, if you want, barriers. In the edited collection that uh, we, we published, the internationalization of public procurement regulation, we touched upon that, uh, not only in the context of Brazil, but more generally, that the GPA itself, these minimum standards, they uh, ensure the de jure compliance right? The, it's not meant to the system, the framework, in the way that it functions at the moment, to catch all the de facto uh, discrepancies that render or, or create second thoughts on companies that they are established, let's say, in Germany, to, after, uh, to, to, to participate in, in uh, let's say, in, um, uh, in a procurement, for example, uh, in the United States or vice versa. Uh, in parallel with the GPA, there is the UNCITRAL model law, right? Which is, that is much more catered to provide specific solutions, more detailed solutions to ensure uh, that these de facto um, discrepancies and hurdles are de dealt with. Sometimes it is true, national authorities do not really want to remove them. So that's another, perhaps another dis uh, discussion for another day. Well, uh, 
Mauricio, your question is uh, touches uh, on a traditional problem. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it touches uh, in a very traditional problem here in Brazil that we have this uh, idea of uh, changing things the way we are more comfort comfortable with. And for everybody who speaks Portuguese, uh, it's call called jeitinho. Well, uh, so uh, we have I can answer uh, your question in two levels. First, will Brazil uh, want to really uh, adopt and apply GPA system? Or this is just a rhetorical position, a political way of um, managing day-to-day -day problems? and uh, what Brazil will do for real. And of course, in every other country, people will say, well, if the government says that, it's true. But in Brazil, and we're not talking about only the uh, actual situation now, but in Brazil it's traditional. There is this tradition to uh, adopt something, uh, not for real just for having the idea that we are a developed country, so suddenly we will practice something that uh, just developed countries do, but uh, we will have uh, real problems and uh, there is this uh, situation, the real situation and the uh, formal semantic situation. So the first thing is that, will Brazil, the Brazilian government, take this seriously or not? If not, uh, this will take a lot of time for everybody and GPA, the GPA will not be adopted here in Brazil. I don't think that it is possible to adopt uh, a Brazilian GPA way of living. Uh, let's put this way, uh, in the sense that we will change GPA for uh, internal uh, point of view. Right? So uh, if Brazil carries this on and GPA uh, is adopted, so Brazil will be subjected to all the control instrument instruments the tools that GPA uh, provides for uh, other countries to uh, defend the integrity of the system. Let's put it this way. Uh, I, I think that uh, I'm old enough not to be naive. And I know that in Mauricio who uh, asked the question, uh, I think that we both know that we are at the risk of uh, not doing our homework here in Brazil. And this is the most important thing. And one of the goals of this webinar was precisely to uh, uh, have you uh, Europeans uh, sharing your experience with us and letting us know how GPA really works, what's the uh, core issues, and try to um, disseminate, it's a, a bad word now, disseminate this here in uh, Brazil. Of course, we have another problem now, it's the COVID-19 and the effects uh, on uh, globalization. We don't know what will happen uh, after that, what will be the effects of the pandemics on uh, globalization. And uh, uh, we must wait uh, to have a, um, a position, a more consistent position, a more stable situation to make uh, evaluations. But I think that 
it's time for Brazil to get adult and start being childish, like we have been for the last 500 years. That's it. Once again, Professor Marfal, thank you for the explanations. And uh, we are really over time. So uh, many thank you. And uh, thank you, Professor Aris, Professor Paula, Professor Marçal, and Professor Cesar, the last both for the invitation. And uh, I want to thank you, everyone, the web viewers that are following us and for this presence and invite everyone to our next meeting because I assume it will happen. I don't remember the date. So do you remember, Professor Paula, where's the next meeting? Next, next week. Next uh, week. Uh, Thursday, uh, I think it's uh, August 6th, I think. August 6th, all right. So thank you again, Professor Marçal. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. I hope you, you, all of you enjoyed this, this webinar. So thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for having me.